Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Good morning. It is Thursday, the 10th of December. Happy Thursday. Thanks for joining us today. Headline Fauci and Kamala among famous names on the most mispronounced words list this year. Yeah, so some of these will surprise you, and of course, some of them will not surprise you. So there you go. There's a video there of of both Fauci and uh, Kamala. And this is compiled by the US captioning company, which captions and subtitles real time events on TV and in courtrooms. So the list was released Wednesday and identifies the words that proved most challenging for news readers and people on television to pronounce this year. Yeah, this year's uh, been a year dominated by presidential politics and the coronavirus pandemic. They said all of these have added some new phrases to our national vocabulary, which make take take some practice. So the first one is is Anthony Fauci. And then uh, that that one at the very top. Yeah. top. We didn't know that the South Korean boy band is BTS, but we didn't know. Yeah, this is how a, to say the full name. The, this is a, a Peng Pengtan So Nyeondan. Very it's a full good. name of South Korean. Uh, which one of them? Yeah. Boy, boy band mm -hmm. BTS. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which stands for a group of bulletproof boys or bulletproof boy scouts. <laughs> I didn't know that either. <laughs> and then Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, the Greek basketball player plays for the Bucks, MVP for the NBA this past year. And of course, we heard Isaias, the name given to a powerful hurricane that caused significant damage to the East Coast Caribbean this summer. Most of us, us had that one nailed mm -hmm. pretty early on, but uh, it was tricky for others. Yeah, the vice president-elect Kamala Harris, she explains in her biography, say it like Kamala, like the punctuation mark, comma. And I must have missed this social media I did too. thing. Um, I didn't know people were mispronouncing Leonardo da Vinci, which is the Italian painter. Apparently it was part of a meme earlier this year. And then mm -hmm. there's uh, Doc Antle, who was on Tiger King, but we, we're not even going to attempt that one. It's the Mama Hunt. Oh, yeah. M Mama Hunt, not going to say it. Yeah. And then, uh, and, then, <laughs> and then Nevada and Yosemite's want to be mispronounced this year. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe somebody was rushing through a script or something. I, I don't honestly know. Obviously, uh, home state of Vegas that played a central role in the presidential election. Mm -hmm. And then in the article here, um, it said that apparently the president accidentally mispronounced mm -hmm. Yosemite back in August, August. But I don't remember seeing or hearing that. I don't remember that either. I mean, but... how do you, well, what else would you say for Yosemite? Well, maybe he said Yosemite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Let's take a look at today's 9 at 9. The FDA meets today to consider emergency use authorization of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. If approved, millions of doses will be shipped across the country within 24 hours. The Indiana grandfather accused of dropping his 18-month-old granddaughter to her death from a cruise ship window will be sentenced today. Salvatore Anello pleaded guilty to negligent homicide in the July 2019 death. Bear County bars that only serve drinks will have to close by 11 o'clock tonight and remain closed until further notice. County Judge Nelson Wolf issued the order after the COVID-19 positivity rate spiked above 10%. President Donald Trump is asking the Supreme Court to intervene in a lawsuit brought by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. It seeks to invalidate millions of votes in Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. The House of Representatives has passed a temporary funding bill. It sets December 18th as the deadline for Congress to wrap up both a coronavirus relief measure and a $1.4 trillion government spending bill. Facebook is facing two major lawsuits from the federal government and dozens of states who claim the company is an illegal monopoly. They're demanding Facebook sell Instagram and WhatsApp. U.S. Justice Department is investigating the finances of President-elect Joe Biden's son. Hunter Biden says he learned yesterday the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware is looking into his tax affairs. Hanukkah begins tonight at sunset. The eight-day festival of lights is celebrated by millions of Jewish people around the world. Spurs announced the three preseason games will be televised this year. That's because fans will not be allowed into arenas until at least January 1st. The Silver and Black take on the Thunder Saturday at 6 on Fox Sports Southwest. And that is today's Night at Nine. Had anybody mispronounce your name in any form or fashion? Mm. Uh, yeah, a little bit. You mean my last name or my first name? Whatever. Yeah, it's actually yeah. it's actually Serna, but I go by Serna because that's how I grew up. Gotcha. And my dad kind of 
changed it to make it easier for people. I've had people mess up the spelling of Austin. Really? And, and they're like, how do you spell that again? I was like, Austin, like Texas. And then I, you know, assume that not everybody knows their state capitals oh, that that's well. True. Yeah, it's a <laughs> then, and then I wind up with the O-S-T-I-N or something like that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I grew up here, so I just can't imagine not knowing Austin. Yeah. Ditto. Very nice name. Thank, thank you. So is Stan <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Taking a look outside with live cam, we're at 53 degrees. It already warmed up quite a bit. Yeah, temperatures are definitely warming up quickly again today. We, we've had this in the last couple days, right? Well, the, things will start to change as we get into tonight and tomorrow. Rain chances coming back into play here right now. 53 degrees. Dew point is at 37. We've got a late northerly wind at about three miles per hour. So uh, off to a great start. It is sunny in San Antonio, but there are some clouds off to the south and east. I'll show you that in just a second. First, let's look at the temperatures for today up around 75, maybe a little bit warmer than that later this afternoon. We'll call it mostly sunny, but clouds will be on the increase uh, later this evening. And we're also watching some clouds at the moment uh, just southeast of San Antonio. As I mentioned, you see that uh, sort of thin cloud deck right there. Looks like it's trying to dissipate, but that may work its way into San Antonio for a brief time this morning. Just So just a heads up, mostly cloudy now in Seguin and Floresville. And we have seen a little bit of fog out there, too, especially down closer to the coast. 59 Bernie Stage, 50 Rio Medina, 50 in Castroville. And uh, most places will be in the 50s here soon. You see those increasing clouds there, 74 by 5 o'clock, and uh, look for 66 by 8 p.m. Southeast Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. We'll, we'll time out those rain chances for you tomorrow. And the drought monitor just came in. We're going to get you updated on that coming up in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Taking a look outside with TransGuide this morning. Uh, things running pretty smoothly right now. And top stories we are following today. Three people have been arrested following a deadly shooting in southeast Bear County on Tuesday night. Victim of that shooting identified as 24 year old Josh Fowler. Lane Devin Wooten, Jennifer Wooten Blankenship and William Blankenship have each been charged with murder. Witnesses told investigators that Fowler was visiting a home in the 6800 block of East Loop 1604. Bear County Sheriff's Office tells us at some point there was an argument and Fowler was shot in the torso. He later died at Bamsey. Last night, the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force found the three suspects at a motel in Guadalupe County and arrested them. Wooten's bond was set at $300,000, Jennifer's at $150,000, and Williams at $250,000. It's almost been a year since a San Antonio man was shot and killed on the northeast side, and the person responsible has yet to be found. Now, San Antonio police are hoping you can help them solve the case. They tell us 19-year-old Aiden Hoffman was shot back on December 30th of last year. Now this happened at the Echo Apartments in the 13,600 block of O'Connor Road. Hoffman was able to drive away from the scene, but later died at a nearby Whataburger. You have any info that can help uh, detectives in this case, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. The first group of people who will be joining the new U.S. Space Force are set to graduate today right here in Military City, USA. Seven enlistees from San Antonio graduating from basic training. It's a live look at the ceremony, which just started a few minutes ago at Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland. The seven enlistees among more than 700 graduates from the 320th Training Squadron. And you can watch the ceremony live right now on KSET.com. By the way, the Space Force will be celebrating its first anniversary on December 20th. And congratulations. Thank you so much for your service. In your other morning headlines, a man gets beat up for just wearing a mask. And it's Grinch time. And an experimental rocket blows up. Our David Sears is here. Hey, good morning. Good morning, David. Good thing it was an experimental rocket. Yeah, down there deep south Texas, yeah. too. Yeah, so that's tell you just a second. But first, this is the face of Daniel Troublefield. He was beaten and bruised and all stitched up. Daniel attacked for defending wearing a mask. The attackers, two guys not wearing masks. This happened in Seattle. Troublefield was leaving a store as he approached his car, that white car right there. The two guys started taunting him about the mask. He says that they called him a snowflake, told him it was a hoax. Troublefield said he tried to explain things to him, and that turned out to be a huge mistake. To my regret, I walked up to the car and asked that I, I was trying to explain that it's it is science and uh, they should be wearing a mask because they're endangering me and everybody else in the store by not having a mask on. The gentleman tapped on my chest and I flipped up his hat and that's when they both got out of the car. One grabbed me by the neck in a chokehold and uh, uh, got me down to the ground. 
Uh, and uh, before I knew it, I was getting my face pummeled with fists. In the hospital, all black and blue, swollen eye, busted nose and stitches. The attackers took off. Troublefield says he hopes they get caught and end up in jail. Police are investigating. And this is why you want one of those doorbell ring cameras or other security cameras. This happened in California. A woman ordered a game chair for her son for Christmas. She noticed it wasn't on the porch when she expected it, so she checked the cameras, and lo and behold, the delivery guy from Amazon was delivering a small package to her porch and then decided he would just lift the big package. You can see him take, take it to the, his truck with the other camera. And then Sarah Ross notified Amazon and the police. Amazon can actually trace the theft back to the driver since he did drop off one of their packages, no word yet, on an arrest. And this seems like the Grinch portion of the show. We're in Springfield, Missouri. There's a guy right there. See that mailbox right behind the tree? He stops and lifts a package out of the mailbox, he just steals it. And then there's a guy chasing him down the street. That guy's Felipe Lopez. He does maintenance in pools and jacuzzis. He happened to see the guy steal the package, so he chased him down, grabbed the stolen item, and he let the guy go. And then he returned the package to the homeowner. I knew that something needed to be done right then and there. And, you know, I screamed out, hey, what do you think you're doing? And he turned around and I ripped the package out of his hand. He put his hands up. He looked terrified. I asked him what did he think he was doing, that, you know, people work hard for their belongings, that you don't need to be stealing. The homeowner, very grateful. Lopez was in the right place at the right time, says he must have the hero gene. And finally, SpaceX launched another rocket, just testing this one. Good thing. Liftoff worked out well. Landing, not so much. The rocket named Starship went up eight miles, but as it touched down, oh, this is... Boom. Yeah, big explosion. Oh. Elon Musk was not really that surprised since it was an experimental rocket. He said they only had a one in three shot of actually landing safely. Musk has always said that's part of the process. Good thing he's got a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> to be money this. to burn. To Literally, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. All right. 910, 53 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. A massive goldfish pulled from a lake in South Carolina. How much it weighs in today's? Take a look at this. Nine months into the pandemic, live performance venues are struggling, but there's an effort underway to help. Myra Arthur joined us live from home to tell us about the case that explains and what they uh, team and what they found in, about save our stages. If the FDA approves Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine, how soon will we get it here in Bear County? RJ Marquez looks at how many doses we're getting and who will be the first to receive them. Let's check the uh, stock market right now. The Dow is down about 41 points at 30,030. And welcome back. It's 914. There are a lot of questions surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine and when it will arrive in Texas. RJ Marquez breaks down how the state decides where to send the first shipments and how many doses Bear County is expected to receive. The supply for the COVID-19 vaccine will be very limited to start, so the state of Texas put together a panel that is meeting regularly to decide where are the best areas to send the first shipments of the vaccine. This panel identified groups that should be vaccinated first to provide the most protection to vulnerable populations. So what does this mean? It means protecting healthcare workers and frontline workers who are directly caring for patients. The next factor is protecting populations that have a greater risk of severe disease and death if they contract the virus. The state also wants to lessen the impact of the virus in areas that have health inequities, so demographics, poverty, and insurance status will be a factor in how the vaccine is spread out over time. The state will also look at the stats and latest case data to find where there might be COVID hotspots flaring up. San Antonio city officials will focus on equity also and giving the vaccine to communities that don't have access to health care services. So where are the first doses of the vaccine going in Bear County? First of all, more than 100 hospitals across the state will get about 250,000 vaccines to start. Here at home, there are 11 hospitals that will get the Pfizer vaccine during the first week of distribution. In total, we will get more than 28,000 vaccines in Bear County. Wellness 360 at UT Health and University Health will each receive 5,850 doses. That's the most in our area. Krista Santa Rosa Westover Hills and the Krista's Medical Center location will get the second most.
Again, the priority right now is healthcare workers. Metro Health tells us this will be the first of many weeks of vaccine shipments. There will be more doses in the coming weeks. We have more answers to your COVID vaccine questions on KSAT.com. Just look for the vaccine section. RG Marcus, KSAT 12 News. And don't forget that KSET is hosting a live stream tonight to answer your questions about the vaccine. Our ECs Romero will host a discussion with a panel of doctors and experts from San Antonio Metro Health and other health and government agencies. It's happening at 7 o'clock tonight, live on KSAT.com, also on the KSAT TV app. You still have some time to submit your questions. You can do that right there on KSAT.com. Very cool. And I went out for my second round of coffee <laughs> today. Bar. Yeah. yeah, and it's already nice outside. Yeah, 53 degrees out there, but it was uh, quite a bit warm, warmer than that yesterday, wasn't it, Justin? Uh, very warm, in fact. We got to 80 here in San Antonio, but Kingsville down there around Corpus got up to 86 yesterday. It was the warmest place in the country. Wow. wow. So South Texas has been a little toasty this week. We're going to get some changes, though, with uh, a weak funnel battery coming up tomorrow, then another front on Sunday. First, though, we got to look at the drought monitor. It's in, and it doesn't change much from last week. We still see that drought is very much a problem. Extreme drought from Uvalde, Kerrville, Fredericksburg, now even into northern Bear County and over to New Braunfels. So these are all areas that desperately need some rain. We may get a little bit as we get into tomorrow. And as bad as it is here, it's even worse as you get out in the West Texas and parts of the western half of the country. So uh, rain is needed uh, just about everywhere. Uh, except really the East Coast. And you look at uh, the areas that have been really been suffering. It's uh, Sabinal, Uvalde, Batesville, down to Creso Springs. They, they were under an exceptional drought over the last couple of weeks. We've seen that back off a little bit thanks to some rain, and we hope that uh, we'll continue maybe to get a little bit more rain in the forecast, and that will help things. Medina Lake is 43% full. It's down 31 feet, and it's uh, down about three-tenths of a foot from last week. Here's what we're pinning our hopes on. This system which right now is starting to move into Arizona. The rain is spreading east, starting to see some rain around Albuquerque, some snow in the higher elevations. That energy is going to move in our direction as we get into tomorrow, and that should help to kick off some showers, maybe a rumble of thunder, and uh, hopefully, it's not going to add up to a lot, but hopefully we will get some measurable rain around here. We're thinking in San Antonio anywhere from a tenth of an inch here and maybe a quarter of an inch across some of our eastern counties. As we look live outside, We've got blue skies here in San Antonio. Notice, though, off in the distance, a little bit of a cloud deck there. It's 53 at the airport, 53 Kelly, 52 at Randolph. We can see those clouds right there. They're starting to thin out some, and I think by the time they sort of move over San Antonio, there'll be some breaks in those clouds. But just a heads up, it may go partly cloudy for a time this morning. And uh, temperatures, 52 Randolph, 53 at the airport, 59 Bernie Stage, 53 right now at Hondo. 52 Creus so Springs. Basically, everybody's in the 50s at this point, minus Kerrville and Del Rio. We also dealt with some fog this morning. It looks like uh, there is some fog around Pleasanton. Visibility has quickly dropped off to zero, so we'll keep an eye on that. It's been mainly along the coast, but trying to spread a little bit further inland as moisture spreads inland. And we're really going to see the uh, humidity increase as we get into tonight and tomorrow. Look at the dew points rising into the 50s and eventually 60s by tomorrow morning. So there will be some moisture for this system to work with. Here's what the forecast looks like. Clouds will increase. I, six o'clock doesn't show much cloud cover, but I think we'll start to see some moving in. And then certainly overnight, uh, we see more cloudiness and a chance of showers as early as midnight out west. And then by tomorrow morning, we'll see a scattering of showers. Uh, even here around San Antonio, some drizzle probably uh, around the area too. And then by midday, a lot of this is starting to move into our eastern counties and we'll get some clearing late in the day and temperatures will be again a little bit cooler today up around 77 southeast chilly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour not as chilly tomorrow morning 60 74 for your high on your friday 40 percent chance rain mainly in the morning and then uh, 68 saturday 65 on sunday we'll get another front and that cools us down it turns breezy late in the day and we'll get some chillier temperatures uh, especially monday morning down to 34 with a high of only 58 on monday guys Wow, Thank you, that's chilly. <laughs> you said you were, you have now some time to look for gloves. Do you have any idea where you left them no. last? No. <laughs> no, the no? last cold, uh, the last cold time that we had, I, I yeah. used them, and I don't know if I left them in the car. Well, no, they're not in the car because I already checked there. So okay, yeah. so cross that one off yeah. the list. It's in the house. Okay. Somewhere. All right. Somewhere. All right. 920 right now, 53 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, surfers take on a monstrous blue giant. And you're not going to believe what officials found in the South Carolina, Carolina Lake. It's all coming up on today's Take a Look at This. 
This Essay Salutes Holiday Greeting is brought to you by Jason's Water Systems. Hi, I'm Ben with Jason's Water Systems, and this is my family, my wife Tanya, my sons Easton and Lake. On behalf of our family, we want to give a heartfelt thank you to all of America's heroes, our servicemen and women, our health professionals on the front line, and of course, our veterans. Without you, we wouldn't have a holiday, so thank you. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas! Surfing big waves is one thing. Surfing monster waves, quite another. So perfect conditions at a legendary surf spot summoned the world's best to challenge some truly tall waves. CNN's Jeremy Roth has that and more in today's Take a Look at This. Watch surfers tackle monstrous waves at California's legendary Mavericks Beach. Weather conditions were reportedly perfect, bringing 30 to 40 foot swells, summoning world-class riders, and as spectators gathered to watch, they ventured out to brave the massive breaks. I mean, look how far out those surfers are. I mean, like, you know, far out in the water. And, you know, far out, man. Some surfers played it safe, describing the waves as untouchable. Just out of control, huge, scary, and I was doing the same thing, sitting in the channel, watching. <laughs> Mavericks Beach, south of San Francisco, has been called a premier break for big wave surfing. For years, pro surfers have come from all over to ride its monster swells. One rider said it's been years since he's seen conditions this perfect. Speaking of monsters, look at this freak. A nine pound goldfish was pulled from a lake in South Carolina. Local wildlife officials were doing some population health testing on Greenville's Oak Grove Lake when they found this gargantuan golden specimen. They released it back into the lake, but not before sharing images online asking if anyone was missing a pet. If you are, go fish. And from freaky fishies, to rad reptiles. Check out this iridescent snake that was discovered in the jungles of Vietnam. A team of American and Vietnamese scientists were researching biodiversity when they discovered the reptile, marveling at its unique scales, which shift from blue to green in the light. The undiscovered species was named as part of the rare genus Acalinus, which means, appropriately enough, odd-scaled snakes. For Take a Look at This, I'm Jeremy Roth. Beautiful. Yeah, I was going to say, dare I say it's pretty? A snake? Well, yeah, I guess. And they put the goldfish fish back in that pond? Yeah. There's probably not much else in there. I mean, <laughs> obviously, you, we know what he's been eating, right? Yes. Uh, Everybody else. 926, much. 53 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA at 9, a huge pay it forward campaign at Dairy Queen. A dog becomes a deputy and a little elf spreading holiday cheer. David is back with a good news roundup. This week, KSAT Explains team dive into the impact the pandemic has had on live music and performance venues. Myra Arthur joins us live to break down this latest episode. And while many countries around the world struggle to contain the spread of the coronavirus, Denmark managed to keep infections and deaths low. After the break, we'll take a look at what the country is doing right. Welcome back, it's 9.30, and while the coronavirus pandemic has greatly affected almost every country in the world, some of them have contained the virus better than others. This kind of stuff intrigues me. Denmark has one of the lowest per capita death rates from the virus in Europe and relatively few restrictions on daily life. CNN's Nina Dos Santos explains how they're doing that. Please don't doubt that this will work. In Denmark, we handled the spring, we handled the summer, and we handled the fall. With your help, we will handle the winter as well. The Prime Minister reassuring fellow Danes that Denmark will keep the latest spike in COVID-19 infections under control. Her government is swinging into action. Restaurants, museums and movie theatres had to close on Wednesday in 38 of the country's municipalities, which are home to almost half of the nation's population, including the capital Copenhagen. And schools are closing their doors too. The PM also urged Danes to limit their Christmas and New Year gatherings to 10 people. Back in March, Denmark was one of the first countries to implement a lockdown. And then, in April, one of the first in Europe to reopen schools and daycare centres and relax the rules. When we were hit by the epidemic, last week of February, first week of March, we very quickly acted. And so did our politicians and our government. So they acted in a very timely fashion, where you can see that a number of other countries that acted too late when the epidemic hit, they had a much bigger challenge with the epidemic. 
In the summer months, the rate of infections and deaths remained low. And a CNN analysis of data from Oxford University and Johns Hopkins University shows that Denmark was more successful than almost any other country in Europe at keeping the number of deaths and the infection rate low from September to November, despite having relatively few restrictions on daily life. Oxford's government response tracker shows Denmark had the second most effective test and trace policy in the region during that period, after Cyprus. We have to find the balance between what kind of restrictions on human behaviour or adaptations of human behaviour we have to, to look for to be able to control the epi uh, epidemic. And I think we found, we actually struck a quite good balance in, in, the, in this country in this regard. The Danish tradition of putting society over self-interest, coupled with trust in the government, has contributed to the country's success. When uh, the government says uh, now you can only be 10 people together, most people respect that, or you have to wear a mask, people will do that, and it means that people do it voluntarily. In August, a survey requested by the European Commission found 95% of Danes were satisfied with their government's response to the pandemic, one of the highest rates in the European Union. It makes sense that we all need to do the same in order to make it work. I think in general we believe in the government and what we are told um, and believe in our neighbour. With the rate of infection rising, Denmark's success strategy is being put to the test again. Like in the past, the government cannot do it alone. Instead, it's relying heavily on the goodwill of the people to contain this latest spike. Nina Dos Santos, CNN, London. And taking a look outside with live cam this morning, a pretty 53 degrees, but I hear we're going to expect a little bit of rain, possibly. Yeah, we, we are looking for some showers to show up tomorrow morning. You saw there off in the distance there on a live cam that we have some clouds. I want to take you to Lavernia real quick. This picture just sent in on our case to connect a little bit of fog there. You can see the visibility is down and they've got some cloud cover moving through. Great shot there showing the situation. So yeah, we've had a little cloud cover try to work into Southern Bear County as well. And that has to do with some added moisture that we're beginning to see. We can see it on the visible satellite picture there uh, right over Floresville and Lavernia, that cloud deck uh, may probably a little bit of fog too up towards Seguin. So far here in San Antonio, uh, we're in the clear, but we are seeing visibility close to zero down there in Pleasanton. So a little pocket of fog, it looks like. That should dissipate fairly quickly. We're gonna see mostly sunny skies for much of today, at least until late afternoon and the evening. That's when clouds will start to increase and moisture really starts to increase. 74 degrees at five o'clock. We'll see southeast Julia winds five to 10 miles per hour. We're gonna talk more about these, uh, these rain chances uh, coming up tomorrow and uh, look ahead to the weekend too, coming up in just a couple minutes, guys. Let's check the roads with Transcad real quick. 281 at Grayson. Traffic is uh, fairly light as they swing the camera the other way. 1604 at Kyle Seal Parkway. Well, they were the first businesses to fully close and so often the last to reopen. Nine months into this pandemic, live performance venues are struggling. But there's an effort underway right now to help them. That's the subject of this week's new episode of Case It Explains. And our Myra Arthur joins us live from her home where she herself is in quarantine after being exposed to COVID-19. Now, Myra, we'll get to the episode in a minute. But first, how are you and your family doing? Well, good morning, guys. It's so great to talk to you. We're doing well. Uh, so far, so good. We've had really mild symptoms, and I am so incredibly blessed and, and thankful for that. So, um, you know, we got virtual school going on downstairs right now, and my husband's down there manning that uh, and being with the baby. But everybody's doing well at this point. So, Fingers crossed it stays that way. And fingers indeed are crossed. Myra, it is good to see you. Let's talk about Case Out Explains this week. The episode focuses on Save Our Stages, that effort. What's that all about? So like you mentioned, when you're talking about live performance venues, they really have uh, been closed the longest and been under the most restrictions uh, throughout this entire pandemic. So Save Our Stages is actually the name of a piece of legislation that is aimed at rescuing those businesses, getting them some federal aid uh, because they really do need it. So we are talking to a lot of live performance venues, whether it be theaters, whether it be, uh, you know, bars that host live music typically, and that's 
a real big draw for them, just about what they're going through, how they're surviving all of this, and what they really mean to our entire community, not just the people who go to those businesses. And Myra, there are some people who are watching this and they might think that it's not a huge sacrifice to miss out on live music during a pandemic, but the effects of these closures mean more than that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've all made sacrifices throughout this pandemic, of course, but you're talking about a business. You're talking about people's livelihoods. Uh, I mean, hospitality is such a huge part of our economy here in San Antonio, and uh, it has a, a big ripple effect. So when somebody goes to a live show or let's say they're seeing a, a concert or they're going to a theater performance, they're doing more than just spending money typically on the price of that ticket. They may be paying for parking. They may go to a restaurant. Uh, it's also a big draw for uh, businesses and jobs to come to a city? Do they have amenities that people would want to and be able to enjoy? So there is that wide reaching effect if these businesses were to close, not only economically, but culturally as well. So we're taking a look at what that could mean uh, if these don't these businesses don't survive this pandemic. Bars and performance venues were allowed to reopen under certain circumstances or conditions, Myra. What are some of the ways they're surviving? Well, you know, they're pivoting like the rest of us, uh, but they are having to do smaller shows. Sometimes shows have gone virtually. Uh, we're actually focused on one theater performance where they dwindled their cast down to one person in order to prevent the spread. It was one person on stage for nearly two hours, done virtually. Uh, they're deep cleaning. They're bringing in some of the robots that we've seen being used to try to make sure that ever, all the seats are disinfected. Uh, bars are having to move things outside and you know make sure people are staying with their groups. So at their own tables, wearing their masks, social distancing. So a lot of policing goes into that that they're certainly not used to. Uh, but they're doing that to try to bring in some money where they can. A lot of changes. And Myra, how can people watch this episode? All right, it is out now. You can watch it on demand on ksat.com slash explains or through our streaming app, the KSAT TV streaming app. And we should mention that all of these KSAT Explains episodes are on demand, so you can watch them anytime. You can go to those two places to find any episode that we have ever produced uh, of this show, and that is an easy way to check it out at your convenience. All right, Myra Arthur, live from hu hu uh, Hugs to you and the fam, Myra. Stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon. Okay, 939, 53 degrees. You are watching GMSA at 9. Remember the story about the man who saved his dog from an alligator? Well, coming up in your Good News Roundup, our David Sears has an update on the dog's condition and a look at how he's now serving his community. Aww, 43 in this edition of Good News Roundup, a pay it forward lasting for days at a DQ and another deputy dog. And a little elf spreading cheer throughout a neighborhood. Our David Sears is here. So we were talking about paying it forward in, in like those lines, mm -hmm. uh, drive throughs at restaurants, and y'all have done that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, oh. it's nice. Starbucks down here down there? Oh, near yeah. the station, uh huh, wow. years right. ago. And at uh, Dunkin' for me and Starbucks. Yeah. Did they, so you got something and then you paid something. Right, for you know, else they opened they my, like I'm, you know, just right. routine, not not thinking about things. It's like, oh, that that person paid for you. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Let me pay for the person. And now in the back. Justin yeah. follows us everywhere, hoping to. <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Apparently, this works out at a Dairy Queen in Minnesota. They were part of the Christmas cheer. Justin couldn't drive all the way to Minnesota. <laughs> It's a chain of paying for customers in the drive through It broke out. Not just a few drivers taking part, but how about 900? The chain lasted for days. It was worth about $10,000. It makes people feel good. I know our whole crew was just pumped about it and let's, let's keep it going, let's keep it going. Our fans, like I said, we had cars that came here just because they heard about it and they wanted to be part of it. All right, that chain lasted from a Thursday through a Saturday. But everybody in that town wants to know who the Grinch is that messed all that up. <laughs> Got to find that surveillance uh, video, right? That person. All right. Hey, you guys remember this one, that guy in Florida who saved yeah. his yeah. dog from uh -huh. the mouth of an alligator. There he is right there. Oh, my <laughs> that dog. Well, that was in Lee County in Florida. Gunner is now a deputy dog. The sheriff awarded Gunner his new title and a job as a member of the Pets on Patrol program for surviving that attack. Do you swear 
to uphold the constitutional law for the Lee County Sheriff's Office, Connor? Okay, this is a big day. You're going to be a detective now, okay? Okay, here we go. Guy wasn't smoking a cigar on that, on that no. uh, presentation there. No. No. That's all right. Hey, the Deputy Dogs program encourages pet owners to be on the lookout for suspicious activity while they're out with their animals. Yeah, that would be a suspicious activity right there when your dog disappears in the mouth of a gator. Good for you, Gunner. Yeah. yeah. I still thought that was impressive. The guy kept the cigar in his mouth the whole time. Very impressive. That's some composure right there. Yeah. Uh, all right, and finally, a little elf spreading cheer outside of Boston. Watch this little guy come up. He drops off a card on the front porch, thanking the homeowner for all the beautiful decorations on her house, all caught on that doorbell camera. I could hear, Merry Christmas. And then another little kid said, and Happy New Year. And I said, oh my God, is that cute? Very cute. Aww. That's wicked. But, That's you know, cool. I like the little elf. I like the little guy dressed up like an elf. And then he was gone. And then he was gone. But Merry That's Christmas. That's a nice surprise. Merry yeah. Christmas to all and to all a good night. Thank you for the good news, sir. All right. Justin's back now with a look at our forecast. Mm -hmm. For the record, I was not the Grinch. So okay. <laughs> we didn't say me. that. We didn't say that. No. <laughs> Just we never thought that for a second. <laughs> Let's take a look at the temperatures across the country. Uh, 35 degrees, Omaha, 37 in Wichita, 33 in Denver. You know, it's cold, but it's not bitterly cold. We haven't had a big surge of cold air in a while, and we're still not really seeing that. Now, as we get into January and February, we'll, we likely will. So far, uh, nothing too, too cold. And in Texas, we're in the 50s right now. It'll warm up again into the 70s this afternoon. Uh, here is what we're watching, this area of low pressure. Now it's moving into Arizona. It is uh, really starting to move now. Rain spreading into New Mexico, and that energy will work its way into Texas tonight into tomorrow morning. It'll be close enough to us to give us some rain showers. I think we've upped the rain chances a little bit, thankfully, to about 40%, and it looks like we'll get some drizzle too. Now, rainfall totals aren't going to be huge, uh, but uh, it will be a little bit of a change to the forecast. You can see the rain's pretty coming down pretty good now, just uh, around El Paso up towards Albuquerque. All areas that need rain, by the way. Uh, as we go outside and look at the time lapse, it was a beautiful sunrise this morning. And uh, we're still looking at clear skies here in San Antonio, although the last couple of frames, you can see some clouds there in the distance. Uh, there are some clouds, some fog also showing up just to our south and east, and I'll show you that in just a second. 53 degrees currently at the airport. Dew point is at 37, and we mentioned that the fog visibility down about a quarter of a mile in Pleasanton. So that's an area that is seeing some of that. And we got some pictures coming out of Lavernia showing some fog there. So it kind of stretches just to the south and east of, of Bear County. And, and the reason we're seeing some of that fog, and we saw quite a bit of it along the coast this morning, is because moisture is starting to increase. And you see the dew point there in Beeville, 60. Moisture is headed our way. We'll see the dew point steadily increase today. Temperature wise, 53 at the airport, 54 Curvo, 57. In Uvalde, we're seeing temperatures warm up pretty quickly in the dew point. Yes, it'll be rising and by the afternoon we will probably be in the 50s and by tomorrow morning the dew points in the 60s. So that is out ahead of that storm system and that's why we're feeling pretty confident about rain chances here. Here's how the forecast looks this afternoon. Not much to see, but by midnight we'll start to see some showers out west and that rain chance spreads east by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. So the morning commute we think will be damp on your Friday. And then a lot of the energy moves east by noontime. We get some clearing late on Friday and the Saturday looks mostly sunny at this point. As far as rainfall, yeah, we're talking 10th of an inch, maybe, maybe a quarter of an inch across some of our eastern counties. So this isn't going to be a big rainfall event for us. 77 this afternoon, southeast chilly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Temperatures will not fall off all that much overnight. In fact, we'll uh, just dip down to 60 tomorrow morning. Uh, drizzle, 40% chance of rain. Weak front comes through. That cools us down some for Saturday, but a stronger front slides through late on Sunday now, it looks like. And while there could be a shower or two with that front, looks like it'll be mainly east of San Antonio. It does cool us down quite a bit for Monday. A high of only 58 degrees, guys. Okay, weak and strong fronts. Yes. All right, thank you, Justin. 949, 53 degrees. We'll be right back. We work for Santa Claus. We're up at the North Pole right now. That's cool. Are you excited about Christmas? Yeah. Oh, I bet you are. Christmas is so much fun, right? How old are you? Four. Four years old. I was four <laughs> once. Me too, long time ago. Remember that? 
I remember. You know what I loved when I was four years old? What? Stories about the war. <laughs> <laughs>Good morning. Hey, guys. Coming up on live, James Marsden from The Stand joins us. Plus, luxury for less bargains with Monica Mangan. We'll see you soon on live. Thank you, guys. While all eyes are on the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine today, it's not the only pharmaceutical company working on candidates. Coming up on the news at noon, a look at a vaccine being tested in the United Arab Emirates that could be 86% effective. And tomorrow on GMSA at 9, it's been one year since our Erica Adnanda started fostering a little girl. So how's that going and what's the status of her adoption? Erica will join us live to debrief what she's learned tomorrow at 9. And another reminder, we're hosting, uh, rather tonight, we are answering your questions about COVID-19 and the vaccine. ECS Romero hosts a town hall with a panel of doctors and experts from Metro Health and other health and government agencies happening 7 o'clock tonight live on KSAT.com and on the KSAT TV app. You still have some time to submit questions. Just go to KSAT.com. And taking a look outside with TransGuide this morning, taking a look at I-10 and West Avenue. Things looking okay right there for now. And a rapid warm-up is underway. We'll be up around 77 today. Changes tonight, though. More clouds, moisture tomorrow morning. Likely will be a little bit wet, at least to start your Friday. Weekend looks okay at this point. 68 on Saturday. It'll be breezy on Sunday. Have either of you guys pre-COVID gone to Vegas and see the fountains at Bellagio yeah, Hotel? Yeah. Very That's pretty. Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty well, awesome. this take take Bellagio and then multiply it times like 100. So this is neat, and this is going to be in Texas. It's going to be the world's tallest interactive fountain being built in Texas. Actually, it's in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's going to be a coming in December of next year, thanks to a $10 million dollar Christmas gift. This article on KSAT.com. Water will pulse 55 feet into the air from a central island of three stainless steel trees at Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, where the fountain will be constructed. That's not it. That's a picture of somewhere else. Oh, it is? Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. that's kind of like what it Maybe that's like. the existing park, but the, the other one looks like it, it's over in Abu Dhabi or something. I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> Maybe it's just an example. I, I don't know. So visitors will be invited to splash around, you know, the reflection pool at the base of the fountain, making it one of the largest and most beautiful free water parks in Texas. It's being designed by an L.A.-based company called Fluidity Design Consultants. Mm. Very fancy. Sounds fancy. Yeah. Uh, construction is expected to begin in the summer of next year. Funding for the fountain came in the form of a $10 million donation. One donation. Wow. From the Clyde Warren Park Board member, Nancy Best, and her husband, Randy. But go to KSAT.com. You'll see the rendering that I'm talking about. It looks like a skyscraper made out of water. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I, mean, I have to go back and look at it because I don't, I'm not sure about that video that we saw. And I'm not real good on, on explaining the visuals of it. So <laughs> have a great day, guys. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.